I feel the need, the need to know why aviator sunglasses are shaped like this. What's happening, Panda Nation? Peter Von Panda here. I have got my XXL for giant pumpkin-sized heads. Aviator sunglasses on right now. Mm, do I make these look good or what? Yeah, you might confuse me for Maverick, but I'm not. Uh, I'm Panda. That would actually be my call sign. Fat Panda. Anyway, the um, the reason I wanted to do this video here is, you know, I picked up these glasses. I don't know if they're going to bend them or something. They're not quite right to my head because I know that the way they manufacture these glasses is not perfect. My head is perfectly symmetrical in every shape and facet. But one of the things that I was thinking about when I got these is, why are aviator sunglasses actually shaped this way? I actually don't really like aviator sunglasses. I've only got them on for demo reasons here because they actually don't fit my face that great. And they never really have. They kind of hit my cheekbones right here. And I thought, you know, I wonder why they call them aviators. So I did a little sleuthing, which just means I read what other people put out there. And so I kind of found out that aviator sunglasses are a military thing. And so uh, they actually weren't around or kind of in the civilian markets until like the 40s after World War II, I kind of want to say. But they have been around for a very long time and they were really considered military equipment. And there are a number of reasons that they are designed this way. And there were a number of factors that made them look like this. And I thought I would just kind of go into them because I kind of found them interesting. But I have a small mind, so I find many things interesting. I'll just sit and watch the hands on a clock move around. So one of the things here is that you might notice that the top of the glasses is pretty flat. It's almost perfectly flat except for these round edges, but it's very flat on the top. And the reason that it's flat is that these glasses are made to be worn under a hat. Now, you don't have to wear this flat brim Peter Von Panda hat, but what you can see here is that they don't interfere with the glasses at all, right? So that flat top is pretty important. And that's because in the military, they wear a lot of caps, you know, caps in their uniforms. But then also, if you are wearing a cap, um, you know, a helmet, you know, even the older, earlier war helmets, but uh, a, a helmet like you might expect in a fighter jet or something like that, it's not going to interfere with that. Big Mac Sam, what's up with you? By the way, the Big Mac is one of my favorite sandwiches, Sam. And so the flat top here on the glasses is actually uh, purposeful. It's meant to not interfere so that you don't have to worry about when you put on a helmet or a hat or things like that. Um, the other thing here and kind of the other big design feature is that the glass drops way down here. And what this is meant for is apparently to give you the biggest field of view without inter uh, without obstruction by the glass frame so what i notice here is if i look to the left or the right i'm you know i can kind of see the arms up here but the lenses are convex and so they kind of wrap around like big bug eyes but when i look down kind of down here or down here i've got my eyes you can't see my eyeballs but when you look down here or here um you know i'm not seeing the frame i'm just seeing the glasses now if you are ever worn you know glasses you know, different types of glasses like this. If I look down, I can see these. I can see the edge, the bottom edge. But when I put on these aviators, I don't see them. How many reviews have I done in total? Good question. Five thousand. Five thousand. Isn't that crazy? Five thousand. And this isn't really a review, so this one doesn't get counted, unfortunately. But um, so it gives you a really big field of view, kind of like bug eyes, which is pretty cool. And so you can kind of see everything. And I think that's important when you are a fighter pilot. You're kind of looking around, moving those eyes, eyes darting around. You can't see my eyes darting around here, but they're darting around. And for the most part, nothing about the glasses interferes. So good field of view, right? The other thing I learned here is that it means that aviator sunglasses generally are not polarized because they don't recommend that they are because they don't want to interfere with Screens that you might be looking at, you know, the avionics, the instruments, uh, books, maps, charts, anything like that. And so they are just kind of standard tinted lenses. Um, insane in the membrane. That's a good way to be insane. Um, uh, 
part of my posse. Yeah. Um, we're going to be doing more reviews too. So stay tuned. Big Mac Sam. You're my favorite. Um, but that means that uh, they're just tinted and usually gray. In fact, the FAA re recommends gray and uh, also recommends that you don't have apparently any of these fancy types of sunglasses, the ones that like auto dim and things like that, because maybe they dim at the exact wrong time. So just kind of standard gray tints. And sometimes they are, what do they call it? Like faded where, um, you know, there might be a little less tint at the bottom, you know? So if you're looking at something that might be in the shadows on your lap, obstructed by, you know, the console or something like that, where it might be a little darker, it's going to be maybe a little lighter. So you may have seen aviators with a little bit of a graduated tint to them, and that's intentional as well. And Rhett, lurking, so am I. That's why I'm on here. I'm just lurking on the internet. That's why I'm kind of going off on and off hours so that nobody sees me I'm trying to stay secret out here on the internet. But glad to have you. Max, Sam, Rhett. Um, and then lastly... Um, the helmet hat thing led to some other issues or other design features. So what you might be able to see here is that the arms generally on aviator sunglasses are very, very slim. It might be a little hard to see there, but they are just kind of like straight sheet metal. And that is because, you know, again, here's my hat. This isn't a great example, but if I am wearing a helmet, something that's kind of coming across my face, what you want is to be able to put these glasses on underneath that. And as opposed to some sunglasses or some glasses, you know, like these plastic ones with a thicker arm on it, that's going to uh, press those into your head. So to have these really slim means that they will stay on your face. But yet if you are wearing some sort of headgear or helmet, it's not creating some uncomfortable pressure point right there, right? So that's why they're very slim. And I also found while these don't have it, they kind of have your more standard rounded arms on the glasses right up here, this little rounded part. What they do often come with is what they call bayonet temples. So this arm would be just straight and it would just be slightly curved in. And so it would just go around. It wouldn't loop around your ears. But that was also so that you wouldn't have to take off your helmet when you were putting these on or pulling them off. They would just go straight in. And I can't even do it here because you're kind of hitting your face here. And I, I, I kind of have to do something to get past my ears. But the bayonet arms were meant because if you were wearing that helmet and you wanted to just go straight in there, you could get them on too. So there was a lot of intention, apparently, in the way the aviator sunglasses were designed. Like I said, they were designed really with purpose in mind, military purpose. And in fact, because of that, they weren't really thought of as a, you know, style element until really recently. And I think the history from the military to civilian use was that Bosch and Loam, I think, a name that you might recognize, at least I recognize them from like eye drops and things like that, is that they were the original inventors of this, designing it for aviator use. And then they sold the design, I think, to Ray-Ban. And Ray-Ban really brought this out to the civilian market, made it kind of an icon, made it something of a fashion statement. And now you see aviators all over and they are worn very commonly by people who are not aviators. But um, that's how they did it. And it really hasn't only been, or it's only been really the last 60 years or so that aviators have kind of been considered something of a civilian fashion piece. Uh, I kind of think of them like a Hummer or the Mercedes G-Wagon, you know, things that went from military to civilian, from tactical to practical. So, yeah, and Top Gun totally made them popular in the 80s. And actually, that's what got me on this, Rhett, is that I was watching one of the trailers for Top Gun 2, which now finally has a release date. It's either March or May. It's one of the M spring months. So it's finally coming out a couple years later than anticipated. And Top Gun was just one of my favorite movies. That's where I kind of got into them. And that's where I got my first pair of aviators. And I realized that they don't really fit my face. So what I also think is that they weren't really designed with kind of Asian faces. You know, as you can see, they have these little nose pads. But especially on my face, my nose kind of sticks out. And so it kind of pushes the glasses out. And um, then my cheekbones really come out. And so they kind of rest on my cheekbones. Which is actually okay because it creates a really good seal to block out the sun but i think for some people um 
maybe the traditional aviator face shape, they're going to fit like a glove, almost like glasses. So do I know you, First Zerg? Yeah, we're friends, First Zerg. Why are you acting like we don't know each other? Like we're compadres, bros, dude. What's up? What's up, my bro? So anyway, that's why Christine... Christine just said hi to everyone. And so everyone, say hi to Christine. Glad to have you here. Hopefully that has answered the question that you have never asked yourself. Why aviator sunglasses are shaped the way they are. So that's it. That's all I wanted to share with you this afternoon here because as I was figuring it out, um, I just thought it was interesting enough to share. Uh, I will also say to Sam, how much were these? These are X. L aviator sunglasses and i'm going to tell you that uh you'd be surprised these were not expensive so i know some aviators can go into crazy crazy prices but for me i have a really wide head so i need wide glasses anyway so i kind of don't um what's the word just buy them off the rack i always special order these these lens widths are 62 millimeters which is probably going to be way too big for most people they're considered xl sunglasses for wide faces 148 millimeters overall they are by grinder punch and they were 12 dollars 99 so if you actually want these grinder punch aviator sunglasses these are the chrome rimmed gray lens but they do make them with like the revo lens and silver lens and flat mirror lens and all that stuff and if you have a big face maybe that's what you want so if this is what you want i'm going to put a link to these specifically in the description below but i will also put a link to just some general inexpensive aviator sunglasses but 12.99 dude you can't beat this i mean if i get into my jet and smash these glasses up i won't lose any sleep over it so that's it uh oh christine wants to know what reviews are coming up soon because she wants a sneak peek well i have some reviews coming up soon and they are all um some of these are already in the can and ready to go and i would thought uh while i share that with you christine i'm just kind of curious what kind of products do you find interesting so i always like uh discovering stuff that other people find interesting too but I've got some stuff coming up, just some like some household stuff, um, things that I use to just make my life around the house easier, some pretty universal stuff, not necessarily tech and those types of things. I've got some more golf stuff coming up as we start flirting with spring, so kind of some golf uh, equipment that I've saved. I will also tell you the big one that I am really excited about, free Portillo's Fries coupon, mmm, Portillo's Fries. Have you ever had their cake shake? Mmm, cake shake. But I will tell you, Christine, uh, in terms of the household stuff, and I was going to talk about this maybe in another video, but you've probably seen that I bought some cordless battery-powered Toro tools in the past. And what I realized here, and I think it's actually kind of a strategy, it's like when you buy a Gillette razor, you buy the Gillette blades. Once I have a set of batteries... I kind of want to stay within that brand so that I can reuse the same batteries I have for all the other tools. It's kind of like that with the Black & Decker hand tools. I've noticed that I've just been bought, buying like Black & Decker, like small cordless drills, the cordless screwdriver, all that stuff, leaf blower, because I already have the Black & Decker batteries. Now I have the Toro batteries and they, they're like these big batteries uh, that fit not only the snow blowers that I've been using in the powered shovel, but they also fit their weed whacker and their hedge trimmer and their lawn mowers and all this stuff. And so guess what? I bought them all. I got them all because I've already got the batteries, you know, buying the tools almost the easy part at that point. So like I said, I think it's like the Gillette strategy. Big Mac Sam, how did I come up with the name Peter Von Panda? But look, that's not my real name. Um, that's a great question. So Here's the uh, short answer. I was actually thinking about doing a video about this too. I, that question doesn't come up nearly as often as you might think it would, even though I think it would come up often. So anyway, um, I am Korean by birth. I was actually uh, an orphan in South Korea in Seoul at uh, birth. And for the first two years of my life, I lived in an orphanage or foster home, some combination of the two. And then I was actually adopted by my parents who live in Detroit and are both of German descent. So um, even though I am Korean in all looks and feels, I don't speak any Korean, 
although I have been to Korea since then to do some, to do a visit and just tourism stuff. Um, I grew up in kind of a German household. In fact, my grandmother spoke German, you know, and some of her siblings and her aunt and uncles and stuff like that actually spoke German because they immigrated eh, kind of early in her life. Um, so I have this kind of Korean biological background and then this German kind of practical background. And so, and then of course, my name is Pete. And so I wanted a name that kind of paid tribute to my Asian side, as well as embraced and thanked my Germanic side. And that's not actually that easy to do. And so Panda just comes because it's like, oh, that's clearly an Asian thing. And then Von, which is actually not really a German thing. I mean, it's German in the word, but Von is actually a, a title really given to like the blue bloods, the aristocracy of Austria. So Austrians speak German. It's kind of German. It's all Germanic. Uh, but there isn't really something, anything like that in the German, German, um, in Germany, like proper Germany. And so I thought that was close enough that it would, you know, pay a little homage to that. So like Diane von Furstenberg, you know, von Furstenberg would refer to her as kind of coming from like Austrian elites. Uh, the von Trapp family, right? Like Trapp would have been their 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 family name and Vaughn would have been because he was kind of um, Austrian aristocracy, right? So it doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like Van in Dutch, you know, um, Van Dusen and things like that, right? And now now they're just part of names. They're not necessarily like an indication of like elite status or anything, I think, right? Someone else can, someone who has more uh, European knowledge could give me more insight into that. Uh, Luis Pablo Lee, thanks, man. You might think I fly an F-14 Tomcat, but I don't drive a Buick. Uh, security product reviews. I do. I, you know, I love looking at my security camera footage. Uh, in fact, I, I set up another camera in the back because not because I needed to, but almost like a trail cam. Um, so what I noticed here is that as we've gotten snow, I've just noticed like the footprints all over the snow. And I realized how much wildlife I have moving around in the backyard here. And so I've seen deer, coyotes, Lots of rabbits, way more than I thought. I had a black cat come through here. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of funny because I'm sure they're coming through all the time. I just don't realize it when they're just walking through the grass. But when we've had some snowfall, I have really realized how much wildlife traffic I get through there. So it's been pretty cool to see that on the security cameras. Um, Luis Pablo Lee, grew up in South, uh, South Korea. Cool, man. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't speak any Korean. I mean, I speak as much Korean as I do. Maybe any other language, like which is just some of the greetings, like "Annyeonghaseyo," but I can also say "Ohio" or "Arigato" or "Nihama" or "Bienvenidos," "Guten Tag," those types of things. Uh, Sprachen Sie Deutsch? Ah, uh, not really. You know, when I was a kid, you you would learn some phrases. Most of those things I've lost. There's a song called Si Leben Ho, so I know that that's a line. Um, and I would used to say things like, Guten Tag, Herr Hoffmeier, Guten Tag, Herr Amstein, things like that. Von Richthofen would like Avery to say glasses. Ah, wait, is that the Red Baron? I might have my Vons mixed up here. Um, German cuisines. You know, I actually like German cuisine, uh, Christine. I grew up having bratwurst, weisswurst, knockwurst. Uh, the, probably the most German food type of thing that I actually do like is, is kind of weird. I like sauerkraut. Um, I like it on hot dogs and things like that. And I also love potato pancakes, and you don't really get them very often. I don't know why people shun the potato pancakes so much. It's delicious. Um, <laughs> rabbits are the only thing that multiplies faster than coat hangers. True, true. Um, I should open a business that returns like dry hanger, dry cleaner coat hangers to dry cleaners. I should sell back dry cleaner coat hangers to dry cleaners. That's what I should do. So anyway, that's all. Just wanted to share some knowledge with you that I just recently found out, but you probably already knew, especially if you're an aviator. That's what it's all about. Louise, Christine, Rhett, Big Mac Sam, um, and uh, Nevada Smith. Um, glad to all have you here. And first, we're friends. That's why you're here, man. So that's it. Until next time, 
till some more rando trivia that I'm about to share with you. And I've got lots. Uh, I will see you next time. Peter Ron Panda. Out. We can discover more and explore so much deeper. We can live better than ever things to Peter. Peter Von Panda.